what did Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, drive? That's right, a Gaz Volga M21. You join me today at the wheel of one. Come along for a ride. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today we've gone behind the Iron Curtain because this is a Gaz Volga M21 Mark III. Now Gaz, as I'm sure you know, stands for Gorkovsky Automobilny Zavod, or Gorky Automobile Factory. And they built cars that were a cut above your average Trabant, Moscovich kind of thing. These were cars for middle-ranking party officials. These were the cars that were also given to the KGB, so if one of these pulled up outside your house in the middle of the night, it was time to leave by the back window. Now the obvious thing to note about this car is how American it looks. Obviously it's a very, very Russian Soviet Union take on the American look of the 1950s. I mean, if you really don't have to squint very hard and you can be looking at a 1953 Ford shoebox really, can't you? But this is obviously very Russian, but incredibly, this was actually designed for the export market, and it's hard to think that the, the, the CCP had an export market, but this was the car they'd planned to put out into the world as a, an example of what Russian technology could do. Hence the fact it was so American in its design. But what you will notice are the proportions are very different. All of the styling details, the fins, the chrome, the big bumpers, the incredibly exaggerated front radiator are all pure Americana. The proportions are stretched vertically. So it's not low and wide like a big Buick or an Oldsmobile from 1953. It's tall and narrow. And if you look underneath the car, you will see it's got nine inches of ground clearance. But these are cars that were built for Russian conditions. That means bad weather and bad roads. So the metal is very thick. The ground clearance is enormous. The suspension is as tough as old boots and they had the best rust proofing of pretty much anything you're gonna go and find in the 50s or 60s. And that's another point to come to. This car was introduced in 1953 and ran until 1969 with only really minor cosmetic changes, which is something that doesn't really happen in Western cars. They'd be updated far more frequently. Uh, generally, the changes were mostly around the grille and the badge area. This being a Series 3, it had gone far more streamlined and the deer icon badge hood ornament had uh, gone down to just a flat badge at this point rather than an actual leaping uh, bonnet mascot. Much like the uh, Jaguar Leaper we used to see on, uh, well Jaguars, uh, there were various incidents where people were impaled on the deer which was leaping off the front of the car and they decided maybe that wasn't such a great idea after all. So this was the most luxurious car a Soviet citizen could buy back in the 1960s and even then there was a long waiting list. The first owner of this car was a fairly high middle ranking uh, party official and he had to wait eight years to get this car. Now, the thing that denotes this particular car as a particularly high spec version of the Mark III is the chrome fins on the back and the chrome detailing around the windows. They all got this aluminium detail down the bottom and look at this beautiful pressing in the door. This is, it's not really Art Deco is it, but it's certainly from mid 50s Americana, gone wild, especially with the white wall tires. Now for the export market, these were sent out as virtually finished kits with no engine and gearbox to Subimpex in Belgium where they were fitted with pretty much whatever engine they fancied. A lot of them had Perkins diesels and then later Rover engines went into them apparently. And these were known as the Scaldia Volgas and they had other options that weren't available in the home market. For example, other colours, different colour roof, that kind of thing. Now here under the bonnet we will find a two and a half litre single carburetor four cylinder petrol engine. Now this thing develops an entire 80 horsepower and 176 newton meters of torque, which isn't that much when you consider the car weighs 1,442 kilograms. That's a lot of oomph needed to pull a car that heavy. However, it's built tough, it's built strong, and it's built reliable. There's not a lot to go wrong with such a simple basic engine. But apart from the thickness of the steel everywhere, the thickness of the wires and the general sturdy construction, one other interesting thing to note under here is this Venetian blind on the front of the radiator. This is a grill, this is a grill which you operate from inside the car on a pull lever. So on the coldest of winters, of which they are very cold in Russia, you can close the radiator off so it warms up faster. Now I would say all of these came with the two and a half litre four cylinder, but that wouldn't be entirely true because there was a slight variant called the M23, which was only available to the KG. 
KGB. It was a lot more powerful being a V8. However, apparently the KGB didn't like the handling because it was far more nose heavy than the four cylinder. Now that engine also found its way into an estate version of the car, but that was an export only model. Now, the back of this car is actually quite ornate. Look at these tail lights. They are beautiful works of art. They are like 1920s sculpture or something. Interestingly though, there is no separate indicator. This red tail light is also the flashing turn signal. Of course, we do have the big chrome fins and the big, big chrome bumpers. And check out this beautiful Gaz Deer or Prancing Deer uh, logo, which doubles up as a light for the number plate. And the button to get into the boot is not in the boot panel itself, it's in the body of the car. So you push that, or lift up, and you are in this massive, massive cavern. This goes back so far, you really can, if you're a KGB officer, put a body in the boot. In the back of here, we've got nice carpet everywhere. We have the spare wheel tucked over to the side, a massive wheel brace. We even have jump leads with instructions in Cyrillic. Right, let's take a look around the interior of this car, but there's a couple of things to notice before we climb in. First of all, this little handle down here on the corner of this big bench seat. Don't forget, this is a bench seat in the front, bench seat in the back. It's a six-seater, but this reclines the seat horizontal. So this entire car becomes one giant double bed on wheels. Isn't that fascinating? Secondly, look at this just incredible fabric in the seat this is the original actual fabric the vinyl has been replaced because that was sunburnt but this is the original fabric and see how little wear there is just a little bit on this corner where people have slid in and out over the years but that's so little wear because the mileage on this car is just astronomically low 14,603 miles in half a century that's insane Right, let's have a look around. Right, sliding in behind this massive steering wheel, which is white like a Mercedes. Don't forget, these were called the Mercedes of Russia or the Russian Mercedes. And so it does have a white 190-like steering wheel, which is very, very pretty indeed. Very ornate, this horn ring on it. Although it doesn't actually work anymore. There's a button on the dashboard for that, which we'll come to in a second. We've got our Gaz logo deer in this lovely uh, kind of acrylic and chrome little dish looks absolutely beautiful. Now let's move over and look at the door first of all. Uh, nothing is electric in this car, unlike its American rivals, it has got manual windows, manual quarter lights, no electrification, just a big plain door panel, body colour on the top, and then contrast colour in a soft vinyl in the middle, and a nice little door pull down the side. Now interestingly, the door is body colour, but the dashboard is contrast as well. So this particular car has got a grey dashboard. This is correct from as it would have been from the factory. Um, other cars did get different colours depending on the exterior colour. Now we've got a lot of controls around us down here. Let's start at the top though, and I love this speedometer, but it is so space age. Not only is it green perspex giving it that the lovely, lovely glow, it's also backlit from behind. So light coming into the windscreen actually illuminates your dial from, from behind, or from the front, I should say. That is just awesome. Now below that, we've got a bank of gauges, which aren't actually in a separate cluster as they would be in other cars. They are separately in the dashboard, but I guess that is kind of a 1950s styling thing. Now I've been brushing up on my, my Russian today. This is the electricity. This is the fuel level, water and oil. Now, for those of you who want to learn a bit of Russian, there are the words. Um, now, be below that, on the left-hand side, above your knee, we've got a lot of little buttons and controls. This is the heater, which is apparently hot and cold, or cold and hot, uh, on these two sliders just here. This little white dial, hidden virtually underneath the, uh, the dashboard, are the windscreen wipers. Big cast aluminium thing down here for our handbrake. Then, bonnet opening, which is pronounced Capac, and then here is the black, almost hidden plastic control, which is for that radiator blind for the cold, cold weather. Then below those three, we've got a couple more controls. The foot-mounted or floor-mounted headlight flasher is not that uncommon, but above it, we've got a, a floor-mounted foot-operated windscreen washer as well, which is less common, certainly. Moving up here now, we've got the headlight control, a generator warning, and on the other side, we've got the uh, New switch for the uh, horn. That is very in period correct sound. 
And this one, this, believe it or not, is cruise control. Uh, it's a cable operated down to the carburetor. This is just a cable throttle effectively. So set yourself at 50 or 60 miles an hour, pull that out, and you'll keep on going at that speed pretty much indefinitely. Or until you're out of petrol. Something else underneath the dashboard which we don't know about. And the other side of the radio we have a choke and then the radio itself is a work of art. Look at this beautiful grill just here. This is fantastic. Sadly, so although this radio does work, it's not actually transmitted on in a frequency we receive or broadcast on in this country. So we can't actually listen to it at the moment. Then we have the clock. Then we have the legend Yelena is CCP or made in Russia, which was a, a shorthand for made strong apparently. And the glove box. And that's it. We have got lots and lots of headroom. And it's a very tall car, but something you'll notice we haven't got is any seat belts at all in front or back. So best option here is not to crash. There is one other curiosity, which is not a common thing I think I've ever seen in a car. Uh, certainly this side of 19, I don't know, ever actually. Um, this little rotating dial is for raising and lowering the radio antenna on the roof. So if you're going under a low bridge or into a low garage, you can flatten the radio aerial without climbing out. That's very clever indeed. Now climbing into the rear, we've got the same absolutely fantastic, utterly mid-century Soviet Union fabric greeting us in the back in this great big rear bench seat. And you climb in here, the door doesn't open too wide, but you have got the most legroom you have ever seen. This is a car that officials were driven in, so they have plenty of space back here. Big, big ashtray, um, obviously for putting ash in. Um, no lighter back here though, I notice. Just an ashtray. Uh, nothing decorating the doors beyond the same as the front, just basic controls. In the centre we've got a nice big dome light filling the entire interior. And then looking behind us, a very, very big parcel shelf. Well, we'll call this the T shelf because if this entire double seat system is gonna be converted into a double bed, then this is be your bedside tea shelf. So you have your morning tea here on the tea shelf in the back of the car. That's now I'm gonna take my first drive in a Volga. Now it's a column shift, like uh, Fords of the, the same era. Away we go. Now I'm told there is no synchro mesh on first, so when we pull it up again, we have to go back down through the gearbox. Oh. Wow, it's smooth. It really is quite smooth. It's not a rapid car, but it's not a place to drive rapidly either, so that works out quite well. Steering's not as heavy as I expected, and it doesn't feel like there's any play in the system at all, but then the car is virtually brand new in terms of mileage. Now, stopping is something we need to be paying attention to a certain amount because it's got drum brakes all round. And it's a heavy car for drum brakes to be uh, being effective on. And this is a left-hand drive car. They did do a right-hand drive version specifically for the UK market, where they even put a floor-mounted gear change on it, but that was virtually a non-seller, even though it was cheaper than a Humber Hawk. So yeah, these cars were only really available to senior or middle-ranking party officials, unless you would become a taxi driver, an ambulance driver, or join the KGB. Unless also, the other route to getting one was to be the first man in space, as Yuri Gagarin was actually awarded one of these cars. And his car was unique because uh, it had the blue dashboard, light blue, which is the only one ever to have that color dashboard fitted. Now I'm driving around the streets of Cambridge today, and it does feel very appropriate. It's very Jean Le Carrier to be driving a KGB style car around Spy Town. I do quite like column change gearboxes. They're a little bit unusual to get used to, but once you've got the hang of them, they're very simple and they're so easy because they're right by your hand on the wheel. You don't barely have to move your wrist from the steering wheel to the gear change, and it's right there. A 
thought has just occurred to me though. I said this car's got 14,605 miles on it. This speedometer is in kilometers. So that's about three quarters or two thirds of that. This car is barely run in. That is a violent speed bump. Now these cars were built extremely tough for the harsh Russian roads. And so the speed humps that are plaguing modern cities really aren't a problem for this suspension. It just lollops over it quite happily. a lovely soft suspended ride you feel like you're just drifting and coasting over everything you can feel how imperious you would be if you were driving one of these in the old soviet days everyone would bow down in front of you possibly in fear Now, despite the waiting lists of many, many years and the long production run of 11 years, actually, they built 639,478 of these cars, which is quite a lot, plus a few more of the estates and there was the uh, Belgian ones, of course, as well. So about three quarters of a million of these things were knocking around at one point. But despite those high production numbers, there are virtually none in Western Europe. And in the UK, there are only 18 that are known of, obviously including this one. So the current owner actually sourced this car from Bulgaria, where it had been bought from its first owner, who had been a fairly high ranking official and used to be driven around in the back of the car with curtains drawn while he was doing his important paperwork. Now finding parts for it has been tricky. The owner has actually taken a trip all the way to St. Petersburg in order to go to the official gas shop and buy parts for it. So thank you for watching. I really hope you've enjoyed this trip behind the Iron Curtains, the olden days. If you have, please do hit like and subscribe because YouTube really does value that kind of thing. And join me again next time when I'm driving something completely different.